Okay. Yes, yeah, sure, please. Right. Yeah, welcome to the ninth session of Pediatric Orthopedic Fellows Active Learning Session. The speaker for the today's session is Professor Peter Stevens. Peter Stevens does not need any introduction because he's the innovator. And I would say in last two decades, the biggest innovation which has become very popular in pediatric orthopedic services uh, is that the eight plate um, introduction to the growth modulation. And that has probably revolutionized the whole angular deformity collection concept. And today, I am very happy that uh, Professor Peter Stevens has agreed to have a special session for our fellows. And uh, in that, actually, in uh, we were supposed to cover everything in one session, but then we realized that it's better to have three sessions so that we can go slightly slower and we can make our fellows understand. And also we can take few questions. So uh, his presentation will be for 45 minutes. And after that, we will have four uh, case discussion, which will bring some more important point into the discussion. And we will also learn from those cases. So with that uh, simple introduction, I hand over to Professor Peter Stevens for his talk. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor. Um, it says the host disabled screen sharing. Can you enable? Rishi, can you do that? I uh, enable it. Yeah, please. I think this is my final version. Good. Okay, so I'm honored to uh, be able to present this to you. It's been a, a passion of mine, as you may know, and I've taken it to, I don't think the limits, but I've tried to. And um, this is not the most final version though. Oh, I, Darren, did you, I think you loaded the version I sent you. And this one is, uh, has a different title. So can we screen share from my screen? Yeah, please. Uh, do you want me to uh, share the screen or? Uh, if you, do you share want... from my, if you share from my screen, I might've pulled up the wrong one, hang on. Yeah, just uh, switch on the correct presentation, no issue. I'm switching presentation here. Yeah. Okay, this is the one. It was my own my own doing, sorry. Yeah. The problem with PowerPoint is I keep doing it until the night before. Okay, <laughs> so this, <laughs> this is the current one. And uh, guided growth for angular deformities. So I spent four decades in my pediatric orthopedic practice here in Salt Lake City, the base of the Wasatch Mountains. And uh, on that occasion, being in one place for four days. Sorry to interrupt, and, like we are not able to see your screen. So okay. the sharing okay, is not. Uh, let me share a screen again. Thank you for stopping me. Yes. You can see that? Yes, yeah, perfect. I'll just make, make sure it's the right, yeah, it's the right version. Okay, good. Okay, um, in the course of- uh, Just practice, can you go in the full screen mode because it's not in a full screen mode. Yes, is that better? Yeah, perfect. Okay, sorry about the delay. I'm glad a thousand people <laughs> weren't watching the start. Anyway, in the course of four decades in one place, I had occasion to treat many second generation and some third generation patients with skeletal dysplasias. And in the process, my thoughts changed. Osteotomy was the original mainstay in my practice for angular correction, and that gradually switched to stapling and then to guided growth. So this outline 
includes historical review of guided growth, the indications and timing for angular correction, various applications and future developments, question mark. Uh, growth and morphologic modulation have been around for a millennia. Perhaps the best known is when in China, binding the feet um, for reasons of beauty as shown here. And in other societies, body sculpting, so to speak, has been widely practiced. Dr. Femister introduced surgical growth modulation in 1933 in Chicago. He rotated a rectangle of bone to achieve physeal arrest. And this could be used for angular deformity or length correction. The drawbacks though, are that it's permanent and irreversible. Therefore you need perfect timing, which is often not achieved. And it has a narrow age range. With the advent of fluoroscopy, Dr. Bowen refined this to percutaneous epiphysiodesis with drills or curettes as shown here, sharing the same drawbacks, permanent, perfect timing, narrow age range. Dr. Haas uh, introduced first in dogs and then people, the idea of wire restraint of a physis and noted that if he unfastened the wire or it broke, that growth would resume. So this was the first reversible epiphysiodesis reported. He used this in humans for limb length um, discrepancies and angular correction. Dr. Blount introduced the Vitalium staple that bears his name. It featured reinforced shoulders um, because the physis is so strong. And uh, I used this extensively in the 1980s and 90s, or let's say progressively. However, this is a rigid implant <clears throat> around a very dynamic physis and the fulcrum is not at the cora. <clears throat> so problems observed with the staples that were not predictable, it could migrate it could bend or it could break. As it turns out, bending is not undesirable. In fact, um, some of my best corrections in young children is when the staple bent, allowing growth. Dr. Medizzo introduced the percutaneous epiphysiodesis with transficeal screws. Again, this is rigid constraints with large um, threads violating the physis. And in my opinion, is not applicable in younger children. It may not be reversible. So as mentioned, it, it uh, violates the physis and the fulcrum of correction is not at the cora. I was building a garden shed in 2003 using a staple gun. And if a staple bent or wouldn't fit right, I just put another one in. And I was thinking about a recent case of blounts where the staple inexplicably dislodged about six months after insertion. The problem with loose staples, here's one in Cozen's, is that they're unpredictable, rather dramatic appearance on the x-ray causing anxious parents and surgeon and resulting in unplanned surgery. The options available at the time were to remove the implant and wait and see, reinsert a staple, which is all we had, or an osteotomy, which is contraindicated in Cozen's. So this led to the idea of what about uh, an implant that is flexible and would quote bend, in this case, diverging screws, but it wouldn't migrate or break. And I drew this on a piece of board at the garden shed. The key features are that the plate had a narrow waist and was slender profile, so it could reverse bend once the screws diverged to their full extent. So now you have a flexible tension band around a dynamic physis with a peripheral fulcrum <coughs> that's at the cora. So biomechanically, this is more appealing. Pediatric orthopedics, as we all know, is the most interesting field in orthopedics. It's a game of patience, anticipation, and cunning, and I should say no cheating. So if you can achieve the same effect with the pawn, with simple technology that's low cost, as you can with an osteotomy or a fixator, why not go with the least invasive um, treatment, which is, of course, what the parents would prefer. I have these three models in my office, and when I showed parents, Without exception, they all wanted the simple approach. And I can back this up. I have many examples, but this is applicable, flexible tension band for any age, provided they have at least a year of growth remaining, any size patient, any etiology, any direction, any location, and I should say any long bone. So it sounds like a panacea. It sounds too good to be true. <clears throat> it is a solution, a remedy for many angular deformities, if not most. 
you can make, I started with off the shelf uh, construct using um, plates shown here, semi-tubular recon and so on, making it two holes. The problem is that these plates are not flexible. They won't reverse bend and the screw heads are prominent. By the way, the one third tubular plate won't bend either. So what I did was flatten it in a vise so it could bend. But nevertheless, this evolved toward a more elegant solution with cannulated screws that would diverge in a slender plate. And culminated in the eight plate, originally licensed to Orthofix in 2004 and eventually to Orthopediatrics 2013. And then um, copies showed up worldwide and I should emphasize that's great. That means fewer kids have osteotomies. The key to success, whatever you do use is that it should be low profile and flexible, not a locking plate. And you don't need big heavy plates for big heavy kids. So if plates aren't available, you still can make your own. I would favor the one third tubular and flatten it in a vise. We did a study in rabbits using little tiny simulated eight plates and little tiny staples. The artifact of a rigid restraint is biologically different and less appealing than a flexible restraint. And in our study, the plates uh, <coughs> resulted in more aggressive and faster correction, although others would challenge this. So temporary epiphysiodesis, staples can be temporary, but you're not certain. Screws can be, but not in younger children. And the plate is universally <coughs> flexible and forgiving and I think is the preference. The contraindications to guided growth are physiologic deformities such as physiologic varus or valgus. The good thing is that in younger children, this isn't time sensitive. If you're on the fence and you're not certain or the parents are hesitant, you can say, fine, we'll see you in six or 12 months. And if the symptoms are evolving or things are getting worse, then we'll intervene. So time is on your side. Extensive physeal damage, such as in post-infection or post-trauma, um, with imminent physeal closure as a contraindication, and of course, skeletal maturity. If you have up to a year, of, or at least a year of growth remaining, it may be worth a try. <clears throat> the equipment is very simple, as you may know, featuring cannulation and self-tapping screws, a double-ended uh, rounded guide for the guide pin and the drill. The reason for the guide pin is twofold. One is accurate insertion, and two is ease of percutaneous removal. So the plate is typically submuscular and subfascial, but importantly, extra periosteal. And happily, most vices are near the surface. There aren't many muscles in the way. And it should be mid-sagittal unless you want oblique plane correction, but um, you verify this fluoroscopically. So the goal is to restore and maintain the mechanical axis, medial or lateral zone one, if not neutral. A common question is, do you overcorrect? And if you choose to overcorrect, keep it within that range of plus or minus one so as not to um, cause future problems. So I use the same plate in this, uh, my smallest patient at the time was 14 kilograms with femoral varus unilateral. And my biggest was 185 kilograms with idiopathic valgum exacerbated by his weight. The same implant. You don't need to use big heavy implants for big kids because it's a flexible tension band. And when you apply it to an intact bone, if you could put a strain gauge on it, it doesn't know what the BMI is. It's irrelevant. This is an important slide though, in terms of application. And this was provided by our colleague Vladimir Kennis in St. Petersburg, which is the proper technique of tension band is to co op the plate to the bone, both in the epiphysis and metaphysis. So it acts as a tension band. If you leave a screw proud as shown in the top right, it's not a tension band and any screw can bake or <coughs> break or bend, albeit uh, regardless of whether it's titanium or stainless steel or a large diameter. So that's a surgical error that is sometimes seen. As shown here, here's uh, recon plates and you can see that obvious lack of coaptation of the plate to the bone, resulting in broken screw. So this is an error in surgical technique, not implant design or material. So guided growth for angular correction, you should prioritize the angular deformity is the most deleterious because it may damage the physis and the epiphysis through compression and cause ligamentous laxity and 
contribute to torsion. If you correct the angle first, such as in Blount's or Cozen's or whatever, and observe, you may see improvement in gait, you will see improvement in gait, um, improvement in joint laxity, improvement in relative limb lengths if it's unilateral, and oftentimes uh, resolution of torsion. So you don't have to do an osteotomy to address the torsion at the outset. And so uh, this brings up the idea of serial or intermittent guided growth, removing either the whole implant if you're nervous or the metaphyseal screw as shown here. Even if you repeat it two or three times as they grow, the goal was to maintain them in the physiologic range or restore that rather than allow it to progress and result in osteotomy. So multiple small surgeries are still better than an osteotomy. My original post-surgical regimen was follow up every three months with a standing AP of the legs, permitting overcorrection to zone one, remove the plate and watch for rebound. And it did that for a number of years. Um, however, my routine follow-up didn't always work as yours won't either. This is travel and time and x-ray intensive. Some families don't have the resources, time, or they forget. In this case, child had Cozen's deformity. They didn't come in for a year and a half and he grossly overcorrected. Now, the good news is five seal arrest is not common. I don't have the follow-up here, but I removed the medial plate, put it on the lateral side, uh, admonished the patients and the parents to uh, be sure to come back and he was okay. So happily, and in our practice, pediatric limb deformities are obvious to the parents and the surgeon just by looking at them. And they're readily documented. So this brought up the idea of using a smartphone for post-operative monitoring and even for preoperative screening. If a family lives far away and the kid has bowed legs or knocked knees, uh, and if you're willing, they could just send you a, a picture of the child and you know as a trained surgeon whether it's worth a visit in an x-ray and get started or not. But for post-operative, I have them make a placard with the child's name. I show them how to take the picture with the knees facing forward. And this one's not, this was in, in Tanzania, but not holding the placard. But in my practice, they, they hold a placard that has their name, date of birth, date of surgery, whether the implant was inserted or removed. And I tell them to take it once a month. Now that seems like a lot, but it keeps it in their mind, like the first of each month, take a picture, send it in. And even they know as they look at the pictures, well, things are correcting, we better plan on going back. And uh, <clears throat> if the knees are touching, if they're valgus, the ankles are touching, if they're varus. And then they email it for review and repeat it and return when the legs are deemed straight for an x-ray and further decisions. So uh, at that point, when they return, you can either remove the metaphyseal screw or the plate if they're corrected, and, uh, and then continue the process, watching for rebound. So if they rebound, you come back. If they overcorrect, they come back. If they stay straight, they don't come back. And so and the parents are engaged and excited instead of outsourcing it to you. And this one, uh, in one month, there's already some improvement. I know it sounds too good to be true. Uh, he just hit a growth spurt. And so the parents are more vigilant by being involved. And frankly, with all the... Uh, Instagram and selfies and everything else. This is not a HIPAA violation. They're happy to send this information. Here's the patient, the typical patient, the first x-ray, idiopathic valgus. The next x-ray was nine months later when the legs are straight. And since they're still growing, I just remove the metaphyseal screw and continue to monitor. That's your choice. This was summarized in a poster at EPOS and I can send you uh, the more comprehensive copy but uh, it's very simple, very effective. It will unclutter your clinics and the traffic in your hometown or city. So here's another one, idiopathic, eight plates inserted, screw removed, valgus re recurring six months after removal, screws reinserted. And the percutaneous removal is simple with the fluoroscope. You put the, the um, guide pin in the empty hole and add a screw or put it in the screw and remove it. So th these multiple anesthetics, unfortunately, but it's a five minute surgery. Illustrative cases, this is the best part. This is a competitive tennis player from California who had had physical therapy for his rather obvious deformity until they came to see me. That's his first post-op picture on your left from California. His mother, give her credit, 
was a keen photographer, she also traced his footsteps. And in the case of four months, his stance, he got taller because he's straight, could reach over the net better. Circumduction gait resolved, pain resolved, patella remained stable in, in the course of four months. So, you know, if he'd come in three months, he'd be somewhat better. He'd come in three more months, he would have been overcorrected. So he corrected to neutral. This is a close up of his footprints in, in a four month period. I removed the metaphyseal screws, and this is somewhat time after when the growth resumed. And he did have recurrent valgus and symptoms, so he had screws put back in, and at maturity was straight and the plates removed. Infantile blounts, I take issue with the classification. I treat all blounts the same way, but nevertheless, um, this is a almost three year old. It's obviously not physiologic, it's unilateral. He has inward torsion as well. My friend and colleague, Dr. Reb, described this oblique tibial osteotomy, not unlike the Shantz osteotomy. And the, the, the artist forgot to put in the fibula. You got to cut the fibula too, of course. Um, and you, you fix it with a single screw and then a wedging cast, which can be problematic. It's, it's tenuous fixation. And uh, sometimes these kids are rather chubby and a wedging cast is a challenge. Uh, nevertheless, this was the gold standard in the US for quite a while. Um, I think it's been supplanted by guided growth because it's safer and simpler. So I often do an arthrogram on the young kids. This kid was almost three to outline the condyles and the plateaus and you aim, yes, there's a lot of cartilage there, but you aim for the center of the epiphysis and uh, <clears throat> countersink your screws and there you go. So eight months later, there's not a lot of correction happening. And I said to his mother, well, you know, to speed things up, we could put a plate on the femur, but he wasn't having symptoms and he was running around. I said, or we can wait. So we did wait. The correction may not be linear. Here he was six months or so after that, the length was restored as mentioned, the lateral thrust resolved and exciting to note the torsion corrected without osteotomy. I would reason the torsion occurs through the physis, therefore it corrects through the physis. And uh, what I tell the families isn't that it will necessarily correct, at the outset, I tell them if it doesn't correct, I could do a supramalleolar osteotomy, which is much safer and simpler um, to resolve any residual torsion. And I've never had to do that. So at age four, at that point in my practice, I took out the whole implant and which I subsequently stopped doing. I would have taken out just the metaphyseal screw, but he was recurring. And sometime thereafter, he went on to have a new plate put in, corrected to neutral. So this time he's juvenile. Blounts, same kid, different classification, same treatment. Took out the percutaneous um, metaphyseal screw this time. And if you presented as adolescent blounts, same kid, I would put the screw back in. And he remained asymptomatic. He's got a slight length discrepancy. Um, I suggested to my colleagues since I've retired that perhaps adding screws to the proximal, adding plates to the proximal tibia on the left would be warranted for his discrepancy rather than accepting it. This girl has Cozen's deformity. We all know that osteotomy is contraindicated because of risks and the high incidence of recurrence. And um, her, she's got overgrowth of the tibia. <clears throat> it turns out there was a contributing factor that I'll explain to you, but she's long on that side. This is a regional overgrowth of the tibia and it's Contraindicated to do an osteotomy. These often do not self-correct. If you're a believer they're self-correct, then see them once a year and see if they do. But she was symptomatic, the parents were anxious. So I proceeded to um, do an arthrogram and outlining the tibia and femur, insert a plate. You can put it on top of the tibial collateral ligament. You don't need to go beneath it. As shown here, the screws will hold in cartilage as well as bone. So this does not cause loosening. And although slow, here's uh, eight months later, there's not a lot of correction. She's still long on that side, but eventually she got straight, albeit with a limb length discrepancy and then all the way straight. However, at that point, she had a three centimeter limb length inequality that was curious and ankle valgus, which aren't part of Cozen's. And a close look, AP of the ankles, shows she indeed has ankle valgus, causing lateral impingement. Note how the distal fibular epiphysis has enlarged sort of a Huter-Volkman effect from intermittent compression. 
bearing more weight than it's supposed to with wedging of the distal tibia. In a prior uh, time in my practice, I would have put a vertical screw in. Yes, it's simple. Uh, however, because it's rigid, and because the physis is powerful, it may bend, break, or migrate, as shown in this case. Um, and these are very hard, if not impossible, to remove, and sometimes bone comes with it. So all screw, although screws are simple to put in, and I described it in the early 90s, I, I had surgeon's remorse and stopped using vertical screws in favor of the plate. So um, whatever screw length will fit, that doesn't violate the tibial epiphysis is the right answer for that. And um, she gradually corrected, noted the Harris, Harris growth lines as this is gradually improving. And I also restrained her proximal tibia because uh, she had a hemangioma and I think she had two diagnoses, the cosins from trauma and the hemangioma with overgrowth of the tibia. So I restrained the proximal end this is further correction. I let the ankle overcorrect. It takes 18 to 24 months to correct the ankle, but eventually it does correct. The distal fibular epiphysis is more normal shaped compared to its counterpart. And then either remove the entire implant or the metaphyseal screw, depending on your preference. This is a, another girl with, uh, hang on. Okay, so this girl had Turner syndrome, but also had bilateral tibia vera, worse on the left than the right. And one might say we could try a guided growth on the right side, her right side, but it's not gonna work on the left side. Well, mind you, radiographs are not orthogonal to the physis. And you may think there's a bony bridge there, but unless you do an MRI or other advanced imaging, uh, which you're welcome to do, and if you see one, you can remove a bony bar and still do guided growth. If you don't see one, which she didn't have, the guided growth can work fine. So she has asynchronous correction by, it took uh, almost three years for the right side to correct whereupon the hardware was removed, leaving the left side intact. And then on the left side that eventually corrected. I left, I took out only metaphyseal screws in case she recurred, but she did not. Her torsion resolved also. This girl presented to me having had a history of patellar instability and having seen some colleagues, including sports medicine doctors who suggested patellar stabilization. And I think patella femoral dysplasia is a descriptive term, not a diagnosis. And indeed, her sulcus is a bit shallow and the lateral condyle is not normal height. And so in the sports medicine uh, algorithms at the time, it was all about tubercle transfer versus MPFL. There's no mention of alignment. Well, her alignment was obviously not good. This was the first ever AP x-ray of her legs in my office. Clearly not acceptable. She was starting menstruation, so I decided to do pangenu guided growth. And in the course of 10 months, she straightened out nicely and the patella became stable with no attention paid to the patella. So the dislocating patella on top became stable. The sulcus deepened. Um, as the patella centered and the lateral condyle responded well. In the sagittal plane, this is just one couple quick examples. Fixed flexion deformity is not uncommon in cerebral palsy, spina bifida, arthrogryposis, and other conditions. The best way to diagnose it is in the prone position. When they can't extend, even though the hips is extended as it can get, the knee won't fully extend. You can see he's wearing floor reaction braces to try to mitigate against its effects. This is treatment I don't adhere to. The supracondylar osteotomy has fixation issues. You're close to an open physis. This patient um, from a colleague had loss of fixation on the one side soon after surgery, and as is often the case, was undercorrected on the other side, plus the patellar tendon advancement, which is not innocuous. So logically, it makes more sense to use growth if you have enough time to correct this problem. And you can um, resolve a lot of issues without transferring the patella tendon, which you could always do later if you need to. In the sagittal plane with a C-arm, you identify the physis and center your plate on either side of the sulcus. That you need to see the articular surface, make sure it's not, neither one is under the patella, of course. You explain to the families that the crepitus after is, um, 
because of the extensor retinaculum rubbing over the plates, but it's harmless, it's not the patella. And I circled that screw. Don't use the long screw here because as they grow in the bone remodels, the tip of the screw may become prominent. I had one that irritated the perineal nerve. And so I switched to using a shorter screw at the outset. 16 months later, <clears throat> this is a different patient with cerebral palsy. You can get a rather dramatic change. You don't need the floor reaction brace anymore. Yes, he has patella alta, but he had no symptoms. So, you know, I don't see that you're obligated to transfer the tendon distally. So you gain height, you gain extension, you preserve knee flexion, which no osteotomy can do. And it, I call this single level multi-event surgery. This child was injured on a trampoline. It's another sagittal uh, example. The joint appears narrow and the physis is somewhat narrow, but mind you, the AP X-ray is not orthogonal to the physis. Her physis was wide open, but she had a, a increased slope of the posterior proximal tibial angle and her symptoms mimic PCL deficiency. She couldn't run and uh, had pain with prolonged standing. So I did a midline approach through a small incision, inserting a plate posteriorly and centrally. And over time, over two years, because tibia doesn't grow very fast, she reverted to a normal angle, full activities, <clears throat> no symptoms, whereupon I percutaneously removed just the metaphysial screw. So as to avoid dissecting back there unnecessarily. Here's a boy with Hurler syndrome who had attempted metazao treatment elsewhere, <clears throat> resulting in a weaker bottom bilaterally, or at least not solving it, so I should say, who had bilateral debilitating deformity. He had had intertroch osteotomies, which is a separate discussion, but uh, he had genuvalgum and weaker bottom, so two-level treatment for guided growth, <clears throat> reverted to normal and uh, percutaneous screw removal. This girl at age seven had 35 degrees antiversion unilateral on the right with dislocating patella. My sports colleague knew that patellar stabilization would fail in light of that much torsion. She was too small to use an IM rod, which is my preference. So we used a plate and uh, had good fixation, but a month later she presented with varus malunion. There was a good deal of callus forming. And uh, my choice was to either be to take out the plate, put on a bigger one, osteotomy, et cetera, it was one choice, but I chose instead to <clears throat> do guided growth of the lateral distal femur. And when she got straight, I took out all her hardware. She ultimately did need a patellar tendon transfer by my colleague, but know how um, the bone remodeled according to Wolf's law that the sclerosis seen in the third picture from the left on the medial side, gradually remodeled and resolved. This girl has NF1. She had ankle valgus. She was wearing a orthosis to prevent fracture. <clears throat> she too had never had a full length film. <clears throat> full length film demonstrated she also had genuine valgum. So she had circumduction gait, putting a lot of torque on the ankle and the fibula uh, at two levels, tibia plus um, the proximal and distal tibia at age three. So I undertook bifocal uh, guided growth, proximal and distal. Her fibula healed in four months, which um, was a course of serendipity and a joyful finding. And um, she got rid of the brace and it's not recurred. My colleague, Dr. Mark Dahl, reported a very interesting series in uh, JBJS of a group of anterolateral Boeing <coughs> NF1 patients where he actually showed remodeling and prevention of um, pseudarthrosis by guided growth of the distal lateral tibia. So this is an impressive article. Oh, this is the girl who got rid of her AFO. Um, <clears throat> and she's remained fully active since then. <clears throat> Sorry, that was out of order. Here she is at age six, NF1, age 11. And uh, her limb lengths are slightly different. And so I would suggest proximal tibial screws on the right side to my colleague, if the family is interested. <clears throat> and what about skeletal dysplasias? Well, I picked a couple examples. The epidermal nevus syndrome, this is another two, two year old girl, which produces a vitamin D deficiency and rickets like picture. You can see the widening and cupping of multiple physes, hip, knee, and ankle, and the deformities herein. And bracing had been tried 
and failed. So at two and a half, her valgus was getting worse. She had difficulty walking. I certainly wouldn't recommend osteotomies for her. She had guided growth, which corrected rather quickly on the milder side, taking longer on the other side. So these implants were removed. Here she is 10 months after treatment <clears throat> with just guided growth uh, for varus on her right and valgus on her left. And no halophyses, this is no change in her uh, metabolic medications, metabolic regimen, uh, but the physes normalize by normalizing, neutralizing the mechanical axis. And age, uh, three years later, she's remaining straight. She's still under medication for the rickets, but she hasn't had recurrent deformity. And patient with Schmidt dysplasia <clears throat> with varus at the hips, knees, ankles, the so-called triangular defect that Ponsetti mentioned um, is essentially a, a salter two of the whole proximal chondral epiphysis um, from the various stress of weight bearing. So these children have a waddling gait, fatigue, and pain. <clears throat> He's in diapers here at age 11 months. That's too young for my guided growth. It's noteworthy that her mother, <clears throat> I had treated with a series of osteotomies, 12 osteotomies all told, including several at the hips, reflecting, I would hope not bad technique, but problems with fixation. <clears throat> so her mother expected the osteotomy sequence. However, starting at age 19 months, I inserted eight plates at the hips, distal femur, proximal tibia, and rendered her straight <clears throat> over a 12-month period. The ankles, you don't need to treat primarily. If you restore the hip and knee, the ankle may um, resolve itself. And here she is at age three and a half. I leave the upper implants in unless they're causing symptoms. And um, th eventually they did migrate and I took them out. <clears throat> I would say might've been worthwhile moving the plates up at the hips, but that's an another topic. But the knees required, went into valgus at one point that straightened out with guided growth. Here she is with her, uh, at age eight with her four-year-old sister who's taller than she is. And at age 13, she's remained straight. She has no hip symptoms, um, fully active, straight legs, no osteotomies compared to mom. We had 12 osteotomies. So tension band plating <clears throat> has become a worldwide phenomenon. And again, um, I, I think it's, it's, the key is low profile and flexible. You don't have to um, adhere to a particular design. So if, what about the future? Um, these are a few articles showing the quest for solving torsion without osteotomy by various means. And I'm sorry, I don't have a full array to show you, but you can look it up in the literature. Some of these names you'll recommend. This was at EPOS this year from Denmark and they put in eight plates at a right angle to each other. And indeed over time, they gained significant rotational correction. A problem with this is once you get correction, if the parents don't return, you'll get a growth arrest. So these corrections take 18 to 24 months, uh, maybe 20 months on the average to get the correction you want. So yes, it can be done, but it may be at a, a hidden cost down the road. Another approach <clears throat> was, um, was oblique cancellous screws that are cannulated and then a wire connecting in a circlized fashion so that as it grows, it obligates the physis to rotate and become straight. The problems here could be kinking or uh, the breaking of the wire with asymmetrical effect. Or again, if the parents don't return and some won't, then you're gonna get a growth arrest. So you need to have an escape mechanism, whatever hardware you put in, you need to plan for the possibility that they won't come back for follow-up. In conclusion, guided growth is suitable for any age and any diagnosis, any long bone, any direction, um, coronal, sagittal, oblique. And it's a diverse modular serial solution that's simple and low cost compared to other options. Osteotomy in my practice is reserved for a salvage situation. So I consider this a war on osteotomies and uh, which is ongoing. And it's a challenging for some to accept this. Thank you.
yeah thank you professor stevens for excellent presentation uh, before we have questions uh, we will have four small presentation by our fellows and those presentations have a particular question and we will discuss uh, those questions after each presentation so first right. i request dr akash to share his presentation the akash presentation is on the most important question which we face in our practice patients come to us a bit late and in that particular case should we go for the growth modulation or not that's the question and how do we manage that and how do we find the reliable answer that's we want to discuss from this question over to you akash yes, thank you sir for this opportunity uh, is my screen visible sir yes it's visible okay so uh, so this is a case who presented to us uh, she was a 12 year old female uh, she had came with the complaint of intermittent knee pain and going of the right leg and she has attained menarche so when we did the radiographs this is what we found so we, you can see that she has a varus deformity in the right tibia so and the proximal tibial uh, physis is actually visible throughout the cross section of the proximal tibia and uh, so to so as she was 12 years old we wanted to assess the growth remaining we did a non dominant elbow lateral x ray and the epiphysis is almost fused the olecranon epiphysis is almost fused so now this puts us in a dilemma whether uh, we should still go for a trial of growth modulation or uh, should we go for a corrective osteotomy Um, is that for me to answer? Yes, yeah. Can you go back to the AP legs? Yes, sir. So her distal femora look interesting too. They look as though she had some kind of a, a growth arrest there. The, the condyles are quite prominent symmetrically. I don't know if she has any medical conditions. Um, I So in my practice, that, that, well, the short answer is she's probably too old, but since I'm an eternal optimist, sometimes what I do is look at the given physis under the fluoroscope because a full length AP x-ray is great for length and angle and mechanical axis. It's not great for physial detail. You don't always need an MRI. So what I'll do is look at it under um, mini C arm in our office or a fluoroscope and convince myself whether the physis is clearly visible all the way across. And if I think they have possibly a year to grow, regardless of chronologic age, I would try it. But if I think there's, you know, six months or less, I, I wouldn't bother. So I'm guessing that she's too mature. I'd want to see that physis of the tibia under fluoro. Obviously you'd have a lateral somewhere, but fluoro is even better. And then make that difficult decision. I, I would tell the parents uh, in some in a borderline case, it's worth a try. Like the girl I showed with the dislocating patellas who had started menarche, I said, this might not be sufficient. She might need osteotomies, but since it's tibia and femur, it's worth a try. And I was shocked that in 10 months she was straight. <laughs> so, so, yeah, maybe I got lucky. For example, even on this film, her distal tibial physis is open on the left. So she's got some open physis and I, I probably hope to get enough correction that maybe the mechanical axis is between medials and zone one and two and not worth an osteotomy later. That's so, not a very distinct answer. <laughs> yeah. So this brings to a question like, uh, do you use only the fluoroscopy for the decision making or you use some other criteria for the deciding the skeletal age? So I look at how tall the parents are and I ignore the chronologic age. And being old school, I still use the hand film, but I agree the elbow is probably as good, if not better. So I look at indicators of predicted growth, then I look at the physis closely, but only on fluoro. I don't go off and get, I wouldn't expect to find an MRI lesion here. It's not worth putting her to that expense. So it's that kind of gestalt. And I look at siblings maybe, you know, is she shorter than her siblings? And uh, there are a few cases where 
I did an osteotomy after guided growth. So either, either I was conservative or I got lucky. <laughs> but to put a plate on there is simple and it might get enough correction that she's kind of in an acceptable range and doesn't have to have an osteotomy. Okay, good. So that's uh, different uh, than what we practice in India. We rely more on the x-ray of the elbow or x-ray of the hand to decide the age. And then we take a uh, decision. So yes. I, I think that's, uh, that's probably smart to do it that way. Um, I, uh, I just can't think of many cases where after the guided growth, oh, I know what I was gonna say is, a lot of our colleagues think, well, osteotomies are definitive, we'll do it once and be done. Well, they're also high risk and high expense, and then there's significant hardware and you have to take hardware out. When you add it all up, and I've done a number of guided growth cases in blounts and otherwise after recurrence or failure of osteotomy. So I don't think definitive is a good word in our vernacular. Um, it's, it's kind of relative, but I agree with your documentation of skeletal maturity by the means of your choosing and, and rely on that. And if you have a year predicted, then do it. Uh, good. So then we move to the second uh, question by Siddharth and Devendra. Uh, that case is about the decision making uh, about growth modulation. Yeah. Devendra and Siddharth, please. Just a minute. Just a yeah. minute. Full screen. Can share the full screen. Yes. Sir, uh, my screen is visible, sir. Yes, yeah. Yes. Sir, uh, this is a case of a 10 year old child who had uh, come to us uh, with, uh, she, was, she was diagnosed uh, at presentation with mesomelic dysplasia, sir. And uh, she had uh, uh, varus, overall varus alignment of uh, both the lower limbs. And uh, this is her AP X-ray. This was her uh, lateral X-ray, sir. So she had a, a, a medial uh, distal femoral angle of uh, 81 degrees on the right side and uh, 81 degrees on the left side, both being val uh, overall alignment being in valgus and uh, the proximal tibial angle uh, being uh, 71 degrees on the right side and uh, 63 degrees on the left side, uh, both uh, being in varus alignment. Sir, uh, so uh, our question to the panel is uh, what would be the best, ma uh, best uh, 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 scenario of how to uh, deal with uh, uh, such a problem? And uh, if uh, if growth modulation should be employed, and if uh, yes, and how should we do it? Go about it. She is uh, ten years old, sir, and uh, probably having uh, four years more to uh, of growth remaining. All right, and then you can see she has the limb length inequality because, in part, because of the more severe varus on the left. Although the absolute length of her tibia may be shorter as well. So that's for future reference. Um, so uh, again, um, on the right side, I would for sure do guided growth of the tibia alone. I think the valgus of each femur is somewhat compensatory. It's your friend at the moment. If you got a lot of correction of, of the varus on the right, you have the option of either accepting the distal femur or adding a medial distal femoral plate. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't put on a medial distal femoral plate at the outset because makes the virus worse. 
And on the left side, um, subject, it, it's a little bit granular on my computer, but I would either, <clears throat> I wouldn't rule out an MRI if you choose. And if you see a focal bony bridge, then you could resect this and do guided growth as one choice. Or if you prefer, you could do an osteotomy. And if you're going to do that, you might, and the tibia is shorter, you might take the occasion to correct the varus and lengthen. But uh, to, to the eye, the, var the valgus of the left femur looks more significant than on the right. So if you do an osteotomy and lengthening of the tibia and you fully correct the tibia, you probably should put um, an eight plate on the distal medial femur for future planning. So I, I've had cases looking this bad that and it takes about two years with guided growth. It, it was worth doing on the left, but I don't object if you say, you know, with this family and this situation or this appearance, we're gonna do an osteotomy. Now, if you're gonna do an osteotomy and uh, correct the varus and lengthen on the left, the, let's say if there's a medial physeal bridge on the left, on the right, on her left, sorry, her left, then you wanna complete the epiphysiodesis of the lateral tibia because otherwise you do go through all that work and get her straight and the lateral tibia keeps growing and pushes her back into varus. So I think advanced imaging on the left would be worth it if, if fluoroscopic imaging isn't sufficient. If you can see the whole physis on the left, I for sure would do guided growth of the left proximal tibia at the same time as the right, expecting slower correction. And if she has torsion, I would ignore it for now. Although if you do an osteotomy and you want to correct torsion, fine. Okay, so the question uh, in this particular case is like, uh, if we put a, uh, if we go for a growth uh, modulation for the tibia, then how do you follow up them? You rely on the angles for like checking the correction and at what stage you add femoral uh, growth modulation? So what I would do is have them take a picture once a month and send it to me. Then you know they're not falling out of the loop. And we put them in our database. You know, you'd say, what about HIPAA compliance? People send pictures of their kids all over the place on social media. So it's just orthopedic social media. It doesn't matter if their legs are crooked. So have them send a picture once a month and I would expect the right leg would correct to neutral, which is a good time to come back. And when they come back, take an AP x-ray and see how the left one's doing. Um, so that's, that's the approach I would use. Now, when the left leg looks straight, they come back and get an x-ray and you may have a, a neutral mechanical axis, but a medial slope of the knee. In other words, uh, valgus femur varus tibia com compensating, but with a neutral axis. And then since she's got four years to grow, and maybe by then she has two years to grow, you might consider leave the tibial plate in, but add a distal femoral plate so that at maturity, not only is the mechanical axis neutral, but the knee is horizontal. I've had a number of kids where they had a sloping knee, like with skeletal dysplasias, they may have this combination of deformity and the mechanical axis was neutral, but the knee was sloping. So I would do uh, distal medial femur, proximal lateral tibia at the same time or vice versa. But you do want to have a horizontal knee when you're done, if you can, you want to be within 10 degrees of neutral. Okay, so if I understood correctly, then uh, we go for the growth modulation of the lateral tibia first, bring the mechanical axis to neutral. And at yeah. that point, we add on the femur uh, growth yes. modulation. So now yeah, both take... femur and tibia are working together and they correct the joint. Yes, simultaneous, uh, simultaneous. Compensatory, compensatory guided growth, I guess you'd call it. You, the most important thing is to have the axis neutral, but given a choice, you also want to have a horizontal knee. A varus slope of the knee is not a good thing. A valgus slope is a little more forgiving. But um, the picture once a month would be very helpful. And then the parents, as they say, they, they get excited. You know, they, they look forward to it. And the kid looks forward to it. It's easy to do like first of the month. And then, yeah, occasionally somebody will say, well, well, you know, I forgot to take pictures or I didn't know how to send them in. But at least some of the guilt is shared by them. It's not like, well, you didn't tell me this was going to happen. See, so you're, you're kind of sharing the, the joy and the burden of follow-up as it should be. I'll send, you a, I'll send you a talk I gave, it's a brief one, on um, smartphone 
monitoring of guided growth. And I'll just send that along for you to enjoy and disseminate. It's simple. Yeah, you shared that uh, when uh, there was a POSI webinar, you shared that okay, presentation. Good. Yeah. Good, I probably had a picture of New Delhi or something. <laughs> Not that Salt Lake's any better. Okay, uh, the third case is uh, not actually the case, but a modification of the technique. And that's yes. not by a fellow, but our uh, very uh, young, dynamic uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon colleague, uh, Dr. Mandar mm -hmm. Agase, he's from Mumbai. I recently heard his, uh, like this new uh, innovation. And I think that it's very important to have your opinion about this modification. Over to you, Mandar. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, it's an absolute honor to be presenting in front of Professor Stevens here. So, so it's not my modification. It's just uh, probably a modification which was given by the by Dr. Pale. And, and uh, uh, so I'll just go briefly. This is uh, the main modification here is instead of putting the physial wire, we start off with the epiphyseal wire. So I'm just showing the uh, guided growth of my eight plate. Uh, for a genu valgum, where I'll be putting a medial distal femoral eight plate. So, without taking the incision, I just uh, pass the wire in the epiphysis. This wire, so here it especially in the distal femur where it's a W shaped physis, where to locate the exact physis, it's difficult. We can easily put the, the epiphyseal wire first. And then build the entire construct with the help of the epiphyseal wire. I take a shoot through lateral view just to know the center of the distal femur on the lateral view. And then mark my incision, uh, incision in this manner. It's, um, as Professor said, it's only about a, about a two centimeter incision. So incision is uh, right off the, uh, from that wire. And then as uh, Professor Stevens has written in his article very beautifully, whatever you can pick up with a, with a tooth forceps or a mosquito uh, or, a, uh, or a pickup, you have to cut and don't cut anything which you can't pick up with the tooth forceps. So just free off that epiphyseal wire well. Cut the fascia widely around the fascial wire and pass the, put the plate. I prefer to put a stainless steel plate as, as what professor said is that there's no difference between a stainless steel plate and a titanium elastic plate, uh, titanium plate. So this, uh, I found that this creates a slightly smaller incision. It's much faster than putting first the physial wire and then constructing the entire uh, construct with uh, uh, putting the physial wire first. So I just put two wires. I don't put the central physial wire at all. It's just the epiphyseal wire which I put. And then it everything flows naturally. The uh, the epiphyseal screw first after drilling the proximal cortex, and uh, the metaphyseal screw next. So this gives a much faster uh, operative time, and I see to it that uh, the soft tissues are freed from under the plate. The vastus especially should not get entangled under the plate. And you can get a good color correction like this. Good placement of the screw. So it's just a small uh, modification which uh, uh, I wanted, uh, Dr. Dhiren sir wanted me to show. Uh, just that it is, a, it is a slight modification with what uh, Professor Stevens had first described with putting up the physial wire first. So it just helps speed up the process and it probably gives, like, gives a slightly more accurate placement of the epiphyseal screw as compared to the physial wire first technique. Your thoughts, sir? Yes, so I, I condone, I think it's a good idea. I think um, the problem with the Keith needle that I put in, that I show and teach, is that it may cause the plate to be more eccentric in certain locations, specifically the ankle, the wrist, the elbow, uh, even the tibia in small kids. So in those kids, I don't use that guide wire because if, if you put the Keith needle in and you put the plate over it, it's gonna to be too close to the joint, for example. It doesn't matter if the plate is eccentric above or below the physis 
the key thing is to have the epiphyseal pin and screw exactly where you want. So if you choose to do it at the knee, that's fine, provided you, as you showed, that you're not entrapping the VMO medially or the IT band laterally. Um, so I think it's fine. I, whether it's better or not, I don't know, but I, it's definitely good in the small kids to do an arthrogram, do the epiphyseal screw. Oh, also the greater trochanter. I often put the trochanteric screw in first. I'll show that in Perthes. So the pin is optional for anybody. It's not deleterious. It doesn't cause harm to the physis, but it's an extra step and you don't have to do it. Uh, the technique of uh, Dr. Mandar seems to be very useful for the distal tibia because in distal tibia, if yeah. you use a kick needle, uh, yeah. in that case, it's it's very difficult to have a screw in the distal, uh, in the physis, yes. uh, sorry, yeah. in the epiphysis. So in the that case, using a wire first, is, is yeah. probably a simpler option. It's also deceptive because with ankle valgus, that wire is going to be facing craniad way more than you think. So you aim for the apex of the epiphysis with just that wire. And you can do the same in the lateral tibia, just in front of the fibula, like in achondroplasia and so on. You can, again, with a small target, um, forget the Keith needle, just go for the epiphyseal wire. And people ask a couple things that didn't come up in this discussion, but in general, is there an advantage or disadvantage to maximal screw diversion in the beginning? Some people said, oh, it'll correct faster. I can't recall the author, but they studied this and found that there's no advantage. And I think it's a lot easier to put them in parallel, you know, more or less parallel, but avoiding the curved physis and let them diverge. That's a flexible tension band. The other question they ask is, what if you put the screws in oblique in the sagittal plane to foster rotational correction? I don't think it's an advantage. You don't want to get so oblique that you're out the front or the back of the bone. So conceptually, more or less parallel is just the easiest thing. And the length of the screw is surgeon's choice. But I noticed in some of the little kids with dysplasias around the ankle, sometimes the knee, if I used a short screw, because they're cute little kids, you don't have as much purchase. And the plate, it doesn't necessarily migrate, but the physis grows beyond it. And so I used to jokingly say, well, if a screw is crossing the physis, oftentimes the epiphyseal screw, we'll just call it the metazole procedure. As long as they're getting correction, they didn't care. Um, but if you use a longer screw, that's less apt to happen. So the longest screw that you're comfortable with, except in the sagittal plane metaphyseal screw, that can be a liability. And somebody had asked about cubitus varus. This does work for cubitus varus, however, you probably want to do it around age six or seven. The distal humerus doesn't grow very fast. I, I think most of the varus, uh, cubitus varus, is uh, regional overgrowth of the distal humerus. Uh, Harold Frost described that phenomenon, regional acceleratory overgrowth, which describes cosins and lots of other things. It's not unique to the tibia. So it makes sense to restrain it with a plate rather than subject them to an osteotomy and then get recurrent varus, which is not rare. And then another question is, uh, if we use non cantilated screws, uh, like the technique oh. which uh, Amandar said, in that case, uh, definitely we can put a metaphysical screw, which is <coughs> not cantilated. What is right. your uh, like views on that? Oh, I don't object. It's just harder to get out. I like percutaneous removal. And non cantilated, it's hard to be strip. It's hard to get the screwdriver in there. If you get a K wire in there, even if there's a little bit of bone over it, you can always get the screw out. Non-cannulated screws in general are, I've forgotten the physics, but they're you know, at least half, again, stronger than cannulated. However, as I pointed out, if the plate is co-apted, um, cannulated screws are fine and sufficient because, and because of the picture I showed from uh, Vladimir Kennis that you have a tension band. And I tried to find somebody who could put a tension uh, strain gauge on a plate improve my point, but you can put the same plate in a small child or a huge teenager and the strain is no different. Now, the exception is, and the illusion is, well, what about blouts? What about the reported hardware breakage? It's almost always the metaphyseal screw. It's often not seated all the way. The ways to avoid that problem are increase the, con the convex contour of the plate and make sure it's co-apted is one. Um, but a, a solid screw 
and a bigger screw won't prevent problems if the plate's not collected because it's not a tension band. And the other thing about blounts, I, like others, I think it's a slipped upper tibial epiphysis. I think there's a rotational stress on the hardware that's unique and different than a lot of the valgus deformities we see. And, you know, again, that will often correct if you correct the mechanical axis. And uh, particularly in a smaller kid uh, crossing the 50% of the width of the bone, is it bad or it's like uh, problematic for a child? No, it's not problematic. It, it may be less apt. You know, if they use a 16 millimeter screw around the ankle, it, you want to put a longer screw in than you otherwise would do. It's not proportional to the child. So midline or beyond is not a problem. It's and it may be preferential. Oh, so if a plate's migrating of late, I would just take it out and move it down and put a longer screw. You know, it's not a big deal, but it is another surgery. Um, the other question that you sent me is what about the H plate? I, I think that's a marketing gimmick. I don't think there's any need for four hole plates. And so, you know, a tension band's a tension band. You don't need, it's a bigger dissection. You can't put it in by that elegant percutaneous technique. And, and there's no advantage. And also stacking plates is a terrible idea because it's not, it's not a tension band anymore. You're creating a, a recipe for failure. So the only broken plate I've seen reported was by Ken Noonan. And it happened to be the peanut plate from Biomet. He didn't mention it by name, but that's what it was. But eight plates almost never break. Most of the broken screws are metaphyseal. And when you look back, and even so on mine, they weren't co-opted all the way. So you may get away with it, but it's not ideal. Okay, thank you. So let's move to the last case by Dr. Ankleshwar. Uh oh, complications. <laughs> Dr. Ankleshwar, please use the higher one, like the upper one, slideshow, and then you go to the full screen. The upper panel. Yes. Yeah, 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 please. A 80 year old boy, uh, uh, he was a case of uh, congenital pseudoarthrosis of tibia left side with a limb gland discrepancy. This was his uh, clinical picture and this was his uh, scanogram. On the left side, uh, patient achieved a union and there was a, a limb gland discrepancy. So we did a temporary epiphysiodesis of the right proximal tibia. Uh, using both medial and lateral uh, 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 proximal tibial uh, eight plates. A uh, patient lost to follow up, and after five years, he presented to us. Uh, this was his clinical picture, and this was his x ray. Uh, uh, my questions uh, to the experts are uh, what are the effects of migration of the eight plate into the physis? Uh, how can it be prevented and how to manage this complication? Um, how old is he currently? Uh, sir, he, uh, he was, uh, when he presented, he was 80 years old and now he's 13 years old, sir. So would he be predicted to have three more years, three more years of growth? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, my my point is well taken. If the parents don't come back for a few years, the question is how can they prevent it? And of course, it's 
they should come back. The interesting phenomenon too here is with this seemingly arrest of the proximal tibia on the right, it is broadened. And you often see that in trauma, distal femoral fracture, proximal tibia, that growth will, won't be denied. The direction may change, but it's still gonna happen. So it's interesting that the, you know, it, it appears to be broader than the other tibia, which is of no importance, this interesting phenomenon. So I presume, you know, when I give the talk on length, I will allude to the safe window of two years restraint. And then I take out metaphyseal screws, wait six months and put them back in to avoid this scenario. If the parents don't come back, you can't avoid it. Um, this would point out the difficulty of rotational plates with no escape because you'd have the same phenomenon. So if you could turn back the clock, for length, the, the smartphone follow-up doesn't work so well because it's hard to judge length on a picture. It's only for angle. I, I see my length patients twice a year. And at two years, I would remove the metaphyseal screws and or reposition the plates. You know, well, I'd take out all the hardware if it looked like this, or if the plate's in good position, take out the metaphyseal screws, wait six months, put them back in. I can swear by that, that's always worked. So at this point, you know, his overall lengths appear to be equal and congratulations that his pseudoarthrosis remains healed and his axes are neutral. So one choice would be take the hardware out. This isn't really, this is more a complication of follow-up than it is of technique. Had you used longer screws, I can't promise you that this wouldn't have happened. So take the plates out, see them in six months. If the left side is getting taller, then restrain tibia or feet, well, tibia to be segmental, segmentally correct. Restrain the other tibia and he'll end up being, you know, two centimeters shorter than he was destined to be. And so you can bail out easily. Um, so you haven't done anything wrong. I'm sorry the parents didn't come back. That's the problem with small procedures is they forget or they don't think they need to. And so those are my comments. I think you might be surprised. Oh, I know what I was gonna say in the length uh, literature, it says, what about the two year window? And I tried to, tra I've quoted it often. And by the time I finally tracked it down, it's supposedly a personal communication between Dr. Femister and Dr. Blount, you know, back in the forties that was never documented or corroborated in the literature. And nobody's gonna challenge that window because you can't get an IRB to say, well, let's go three or four years and see what happens. And you can't do it in animals. So I can tell you from a lot of experience that two years is a safe threshold to take out metaphyseal screws. And then if you need more correction, put them back in. I haven't, and also when you're doing length and you'll see this later, if you unwittingly are getting an angular deformity then you take out the plate on the concave side and, and reposition the one on the convex side and correct the angle and then go back to your length restraint. So you need to see your length patients twice a year. And angular, they can always take a picture if they see any angular deformity and you can say, yep, you better come in to have an X-ray and have hardware adjusted. But I can still see that central physis and that tibia. And if you took those screws out, the physis experimentally in rabbits, a bone bridge of 6% of the physis can easily be spontaneously break and they have continued growth. Those screws are, you know, 4.5 millimeter screws. They look big on an X-ray, but their aggregate percent of inhibition is less than 5%. When I, I treated ankle valgus for 15 years with vertical screw, as I showed before I realized a better way. And I always felt guilty putting a threaded device across the physis, but when I read that 6% thing and you calculate what's the percent of a four or five screw in a distal tibial physis, it was maybe 1%. So you might just take the hardware out and be pleasantly surprised that he stays close. In which case it won't be a complication, it would be a success. And it would refute the two year arbitrary threshold that's been quoted by me and others. Thank you, Professor uh, Stevens. Now, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand and uh, we can ask a question to uh, Professor Stevens.
Okay, if there are no questions, then I like to thank uh, Professor Stevens for his wonderful elaboration on the angular correction with the growth modulation. And we eagerly wait for your next session, that is use of growth modulation for the limited discrepancy. And as soon as the dates are finalized, uh, we will let you know uh, to all the fellows. Uh, yeah, there is a good question. Will posterior plate cause irritation? Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, yeah, can you elaborate more on that? How do you put it and uh, how difficult it is? For which plate? The posterior plate, the tibia, you showed one case with a recurvatum deformity. With the, the ankle knee, No, no, no. The, oh, the at knee. the knee, there was a recurvatum deformity and you yeah. put the plate from posterior side. Oh, no, no, there's no irritation. And so it, it seems like a scary place to dissect, but it's not. You can do a short midline incision um, and obviously a retractable. I would never put a staple back there, <laughs> obviously. And I would use a K-wire there. No, let me take it back. In the sagittal plane, if you want to do the technique shown, you can put in the epiphyseal wire. That's where I would do that. So you're parallel to the downward slope of the tibia and your midline, and you don't need a Keith needle back there and those soft tissues. But um, there's no irritation back there. It's, it's submerged. They can't feel it at all. And that's why I don't take out the whole plate, because I don't want to go back in there twice through the scar tissue and take out a whole plate. When I can take the blunt end of a K wire and put it in the um, metaphyseal cannulated screw and take it out with a screwdriver with impunity. You're not going to damage neurovascular structures if you if you are good with the C arm. And uh, do you the, use the, only the irritation is probably the most prominent irritation is for the fixed knee flexion deformity because you already have a fixed flexion deformity. The extensor retinaculum is already stretched over the femur, and then you're putting some hardware there, albeit on either side of the sulcus. And then you have anxious physical therapists and parents who feel the crepitance and they think it's from the hardware, but it's not. And at the ankle for valgus, the hardware is prominent in the little kids, you know, five years old, four years old initially, but they get used to it. They don't wear high top shoes. If they're wearing braces, you can make sure it's relieved around the hardware and it's very well tolerated but there's parental education involved in all these to say, this is where the hardware is. If you feel a couple bumps, there's nothing sharp. Those are the screw heads and it will become less prominent in those locations. Okay, then there is a question. Uh, do you have any experience with tethering when you leave behind a sleeper or traveler plate in which the metaphyseal screw is removed? So the question is probably like the plate itself work as a tether. Uh, or like create a, a physial ring tether. Do you come across such phenomena? Yes, in a minority of patients, I, maybe one in 20, it's hard to say, but once or twice a year, the traveling plate was a liability for those patients because they would continue to overcorrect when I just took out the metaphyseal screw. But in an orthopedic democracy, why take out all the hardware on the other 19 patients for the benefit of the one? So that's exactly why I tell those parents, keep sending me a picture once a month. If, if there's any perceived um, overcorrection or recurrence, it's easy to intercept and take care of the problem. And in the ones who had continued restriction after metaphyseal screw, so overcorrection, um, when I took the plate out, it corrected. Or if they, if they were like that other patient, didn't come back for a year or two, I would take that plate up, put one on the other side and make sure they come back for follow-up. So you can always bail out. I've never had to do an osteotomy, even in those patients. I have on occasion chiseled some bone off over the, over the retained plate, and, uh, but it hasn't resulted in a bone bridge. And again, I give tribute to the powerful physis for salvaging things. Then there is another question that uh, most of the time you say that you remove the metaphyseal screw, but if you decide to remove the whole uh, construct, means yeah. uh, both the screws and the plate, how long is the incision or how big is the incision? Well, I'll send you some pictures. I, I took a kerosene rangeur and I drilled a hole in it. And then I figured out a technique to take it out percutaneously. So you um, take out the metaphyseal screw first, 
And then you put a, a hemostat, a curved hemostat in there and you bend that hole away from the metaphysis. And then you reach in with the kerosene rongeur and grab the plate and hang on to it. And then you take out the other screw and pull it all out through a tiny incision. So I take it out percutaneously with a modified kerosene rongeur and I can talk to my friend at Uma Medical and see if he can make some for you guys. I made my own, but <laughs> it works great. It takes a little patience and it takes more fluoro time. However, it's a big advantage in the fat kids because you don't need to dig down through all the adipose tissue, go under the muscle, find the plate. You know, the, the, the heavier the patient, the greater advantage to the percutaneous removal. Okay, uh, then there is a question about the, uh, for the fixed flexion deformity, when you uh, decide to go for the anterior growth plate, uh, where do you put the plate? Because there is a lot of apprehension about the interference with the patellar trekking. So whether you put it on the anterior surface or as like described by Juan Harold Bose, then you put it on a medial and lateral surface and try to create yeah. a... It, it's on the medial and lateral surfaces. I can send you an article on that. But um, so you actually uh, use two incisions, the superior lateral and superior medial pole, the patella more or less, or wherever the physis is, and open the retinaculum. And then you can see the articular surface and you go lateral and medial to the crest. So neither one, neither plate is on the articular surface. Therefore, neither one's under the patella. And the correction is actually faster in the sagittal plane because of trigonometry. I mean, in the frontal plane, one millimeter of femoral growth often begets one degree of correction. But in the sagittal place, plane, a millimeter produces more angular correction. So you can get rather dramatic improvement. Again, if the plates aren't too bothersome when they're straight, I only take out the metaphyseal screw, but this age group is often 10 or older and recurrence isn't that common. You know, they're growing slowly. And in CP, they're often growing until they're 18 or 20. So it might still be worthwhile in at age 15 or 16 in that group. Certainly better than osteotomies, way better. Okay. Uh, Vikas, do you like to ask question because you raised? Yes. Yeah, please. Yes, sir, I have a question, sir. Thank you, sir, first of all. Sir, in uh, Genu Viram correction, where we put a plate uh, in the proximal tibia lateral aspect, have there been instances where the proximal fibula has overgrown? And if yes, should, uh, should we do anything about it for proximal fibular overgrowth as the <laughs> virus is getting corrected? Yes. So in particular, in achondroplasia or syndromes, you know, tibial dysplasias, if the fibular head is prominent from the beginning, you know, and radiographically prominent and elevated, then instead, I don't put a plate on the fibula also. I put a plate on the tibia and I percutaneously drill and curette the proximal fibular physis. And I do the same with the distal fibula if it's prominent. Um, you know, I, if they have varus distally, I may put a lateral plate on the distal tibia and percutaneously drill and curette the physis. But I don't use a vertical screw across the physis because it will just Physis just grows past it. It ends up in the medullary canal. And I don't put a plate on it. So it's a clinical judgment supported by radiographs, and it's rare to have to do it. But like in achondroplasia, I might start angular correction of varus at age four, four or five, and might have to repeat it. By the time they're 10, if it's still prominent, then I remember to do the fibular physis as well. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, okay. Then there is a question that if we decide to keep a plate for a longer time, uh, do you change the metaphyseal screw to avoid screw breakage? Or like, uh, as you said that after two years, you remove the screws completely, allow six months to pass, and then you reinsert the metaphyseal screw. What, what do you do? You just change it or you leave six months in between and then you reinsert the screw? So, so to clarify, for angular correction, there's no two-year window. It may take four years. doesn't matter in some of these conditions. And I don't change out metaph... If the screws diverge maximally and the plate's reverse bending, I do nothing. If the screw, either screw is dragged across the physis, I would reposition the plate. You know, I was being facetious, calling it a metazole procedure. But, um, and for length, I do honor the two-year window. So there's a difference in the two. Um, when you're doing it for length, and this will be emphasized, it's not really a tension bend anymore. Uh, you have medial and lateral 
devices that are competing for each other. And I put the screws in divergent when I do it for length, because if you put them in parallel for length, the central part of the physis may grow. People worry about a pagoda tibia, which we can talk about, uh, or a corresponding femur deformity. And there's a time delay in your correction. So for length, I put the screws diverging moderately and just leave them there. I don't change out the screws until two years. And then at, at six months after, I would obviously the metastasis has grown, you have a new screw hole and you diverge that. And there is another interesting question. In case of multiple hereditary exosis, to correct the menus varus deformity, uh, do you have any experience of eight plate in the distal radius? Yes, yes, it works fine. And there you want to use, you know, the typical screws in the in the usual sets. I don't know about in India, but the screw heads are rounded and sort of unnecessarily prominent. So you could, by the way, you can mix uh, titanium and stainless. So you could take a small plate and the screw of your choosing that has a flatter head. I don't care if it's cannulated or not at the wrist. And uh, so the heads aren't prominent and it works well for HME to, and I can send an example of that, but to take care of that owner tilt with or without owner reconstruction. And for the lower extremity in HME, the default mode is valgus. Um, I think it's due to the sonic hedgehog, I can't remember, but they often get valgus at the hip, knee and ankle. For the hip, you can't put a lateral medial plate on, but you can do a medial a screw up the femoral neck. And then for the knee, you correct the valgus, femur and or tibia. And for the ankle, um, ankle valgus. So you can do it all with eight plates. And for the ankle, you don't need to worry about fibular length and lengthening the fibula and synostosis and all those things described like that girl known for bromatosis that I showed, you want a horizontal plafond, um, horizontal ankle. And if you achieve that, the fibula is relatively unimportant. So for HME, you can take off symptomatic bumps, of course, but you don't need to resort to fibular lengthening as was proposed by some. Um, they'll do fine with a horizontal plafond. Okay, good, Dr. Gupta, please. Uh, good evening, uh, morning, and good evening. Even very interesting talk. Just uh, one question: Do you use uh, growth modulation, even if there is some thrust in the knee? And if yes, do you supplement it with an external support like a brace, or do you do it? Oh, bracing, bracing after growth modulation. No, if there is a thrust. Lateral or medial thrust of the knee because of the various or valgus angulation. You still use a growth modulation, or would you prefer an osteotomy? I always prefer growth modulation. Osteotomy you, is a salvage procedure, and I use no bracing. You don't use bracing. No. Okay. You got an internal brace that they can't take off. <laughs> they have to be compliant. No, no, additional, additional bracing because of the thrust. I'm not sure I'm catching that. Bracing for what? For the thrust, lateral thrust. If there's a Gino Verum, a lot of these children may have a lateral thrust of the knee. No, the lateral thrust goes away as the, as the mechanical axis neutralizes. It always goes away. Okay. And the torsion in my practice always corrects. So I point out to the parents, you know, these problems are secondary to the, the coronal alignment in the varus. And, um, and rather quickly, after guided growth, those findings will improve. And I mean, if you feel it necessary to brace, that's your choice, but not. Okay, then there is a question. Uh, what is the earliest age at which growth modulation can be used? Well, for me, it's 18 months. I don't think it'll ever be in utero, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, 18 months in the, the girl I showed with a congenital varus femur, she had a fibrous cortical defect with a tether. People get an MRI and they go in and they biopsy and resect those. You don't have to do that. If you correct the angular deformity, the bone will remodel and all that, all that bony Wolf's Law stuff will, will resolve spontaneously. And uh, whether it's tibia, femur or elsewhere. So you correct the angle first and then you can you know, deal with sequelae, but you'll be pleasantly surprised. 
I also mentioned, maybe I mentioned it in the last slide, but the question is, what about non-surgical ablation? The problem with non-surgical, whether it's radiofrequency or chemical ablation, which has been shown experimentally, yes, it's non-surgical, it's percutaneous, that's great, but it's also permanent. And none of our methods of determining bone maturity and growth are very accurate, as we mentioned in that thin length article that I'll send you the final copy, that um, uh, John Birch compared multiplying method and all the others and found that they all have inherent human error. And if anything, I, I trained with Malcolm Menelaus, the Menelaus white method is as good as any. And that's the three eights, two eights, boys grow to 14, or six, girls to 14, boys to 16 and so on. That's as good an estimate as any of the fancy things we've been doing. Now, Jim Sanders and, and Dr. Demigula may differ with that, but in common practice, um, that kind of estimate works well, and uh, that's what I've used. Okay, then there is a question, uh, which is like, uh, instead of using an eight plate, we use uh, epiphyseal and the, uh, the physial and the uh, metaphyseal screw. And then we have a wire, encirclage wire uh, with the two screws. Will it work as good as eight plate? Uh, in some cases it could, it's flexible and forgiving or a heavy suture, some people would say, but um, wires are prone to kinking and breaking. And, you know, the veterinarians have used them in horses and so on, and maybe more tolerant than little kids. So I, I wouldn't trust a wire. Um, I just think, yes, it can work, but I think there are more problems than there are with the plate. And, you know, we tried uh, on that keychain. In fact, I'll show you the picture of the new keychain. I had to get a bigger one. We tried uh, plastic plate, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene plates, thinking this would be very affordable in, in developing countries. And, you know, the hardware is too expensive as it is. The problem is that the center to center hole stretched from the physis. <laughs> so anything can work, but anything might not work. And hence all the metal plates you see, which are still the best and the most forgiving. And then the oldest patient, you know, I've done a couple of 19 year olds who still had at least a year of growing like cerebral palsy. They, they don't necessarily stop at 16. So if the growth plate's open, you can go for it. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Stevens. So uh, this was the first session of the three session series we have. In the second session, we will be uh, discussing about the limb length discrepancy and use of uh, growth modulation for that. And the third session will be related to correction of the hip uh, deformities and the use of growth modulation in the Perthes disease. So I will keep you informed about the subsequent dates. Till then, thank you once again, Professor Stevens, and thank you everyone for active participation. Namaste You're and bye-bye. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Bye -bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Bye.